trees. They give us everything we need to survive. The very oxygen we breathe. The resources to keep ourselves sheltered and warm. The retention of water and our land for us to drink. And a multitude of food and medicine. Scotland was once densely forested and for thousands of years the people relied on the trees for their survival, shaping their beliefs and the very language they used. Beyond fulfilling our survival priorities, trees also provide the resources to make endless tools and perhaps the most simple and multifunctional of these is a good straight stick, a tool I've explored a lot in this channel. In this video I'll use three handmade staffs made from three common trees found in Scotland to explore their survival properties and the beliefs and myths our ancestors attributed to them. Stay tuned to the end and I'll show you how you can win one of these staffs for yourself in a fundraising campaign to help plant and manage my very own woodland in the highlands of Scotland. So stay tuned. Hi folks, Tom from Van Dabby Dozy, thanks for tuning in and welcome to the official Van Dabby Dozy Forest. Now for those who follow me on the Patreon page where I do monthly behind the scenes videos, you'll know that I recently acquired seven acres of woodland in the Scottish Highlands and this is going to be the new base for the channel. It's a place to explore all the topics I cover from bushcraft and survival to historical wilderness living skills to how our ancestors used and lived off the land as well as exploring how to live and work off grid in the modern day. But what I'm also going to use the land for is to plant and care for native woodland, which is the main theme for today's video. So this winter past, I thought it'd be fun to make and sell some really nice walking staffs with the idea to raise a bit of money for this woodland project. But as I was making it, I also saw an opportunity to make a video combining a bunch of topics I'm fascinated about, namely Celtic mythology, ecology, trees and their survival uses, and of course, sticks as a walking and whacking aid. And these staffs are made in collaboration with my partner Kiva, who's a really talented artist. I made the staffs themselves according to my favourite design. Each one sustainably harvested, seasoned, shaped, sanded and finished by me. Kiva then designed, drew and pyrographed original Celtic artwork onto each one of them, each piece relating to the mythology of the tree the staff was made from. And you can see the finished artwork and design process on our Instagram page linked below. And I'll also link some learning resources below about all the topics that we talk about today if you want to learn more. I would describe these staffs as functional cultural art. Now on the functional side the staff is a tool that I use almost daily especially when walking in rough terrain and I've got a bunch of past videos discussing all the uses I found for it as well as a video on how to make a simplified version of my favorite design so check them out for more detail. But in summary it's a simple tool that aids in walking, navigating obstacles and camp craft Therefore, because it's so useful, it's always to hand to pass the time practicing martial arts, aiding in balance, focus, fitness, and body mechanics that is applicable to many other weapons-based practices. It can also be used as a sort of movement meditation. Now, the three staffs share a common design, which over the years I found to be the most useful to fulfill all the uses that I describe. Now, they're all about five feet long, equally balanced, smooth, same thickness all the way along. They are bound on the top for reinforcement to stop it from splitting and fitted with an alpine spike to give you grip in the ground. Now they're all oiled with many, many coats of linseed oil to give it protection. And you know, if you look after it and re-oil them when needed, a staff like this will last you all your life. Now, although they have lots of similarities, they are all unique in their own right. Each one having their own little characteristic twists and knots and things like that which sort of tells the story of the tree that they were made from. Now to best appreciate the artwork that Kiva has done on these staffs I'll first tell you a bit of history about Scotland's forest and what I mean by terms like Celtic and mythology and why I think it's interesting and I'll also introduce an ancient rune-like alphabet known as Oam or Ogham depending on how you pronounce it. Now if we go way back in time, around 11,500 years ago, when the last remnants of the Ice Age was leaving the land, Scotland would have just been a barren wasteland of, of rock and ice and water. But you know, slowly plants would have crept their way back in, from the first lichens to mosses to small shrubs, 
the birch trees, and eventually Scotland was completely blanketed in a thick forest consisting of about 16 species of trees. Now this forest became home to large animals like lynx and wolves and elk and bear and oryx, which is thought to be the early ancestor to the Highland cow. And of course, people would have lived in this forest too. And this forest is thought to have thickly blanketed the country until around 7,000 years ago when there was a shift in climate and Scotland became much wetter. Lots of areas was flooded and the forest did retreat a little bit, but still most of the land was wooded. Now this forest ecosystem is generally referred to nowadays as the Caledonian forest, which comes from the name the Romans gave Scotland, Caledonia, which means wooded heights, which gives us a clue that Scotland was probably still forested when the Romans were here around 2000 years ago. Nowadays, however, only about 1% of this forest is left and small isolated pockets scattered around the country and all the large animals I mentioned have since been wiped out. Uh, much of this deforestation has only happened in the last few centuries, mainly due to the rise of industry, changes in agricultural practices and shipbuilding. Now if you've been following this channel, you know I look a lot at the 17th century, but for this video I'm going to delve further back in time to better understand the roots of the Celtic culture. So, the word Celtic, what does that actually mean? As it's quite a general term and is used to describe a, a bunch of different cultures with similarities in language, art and mythology. We know very little about the Celts. We know even less about the people who lived before them. And I bet you if you had a time machine and you could go back and ask someone who they identified with, they're probably going to identify with their immediate clan or tribe and probably hate their neighbours, as humans seem to like to do. But with any case, the word Celtic is pretty well recognised, so I'll be using it in this video. And when you hear the word myth or mythology, you usually think of fantastical, irrelevant and untrue stories. But for me, it gets interesting when you, you stop searching for literal truths and instead search for symbolic or metaphorical truths within the story. Or at the very least, it, it helps us understand our ancestors a bit better. It makes a walk in the woods a bit more interesting and it gives your staff a bit more character. So this brings me to an ancient rune-like alphabet known as the Oan language. Now very little is known about this really, but it's thought to have originated in Ireland between the 1st and 4th century before it came over to Scotland. And it was the main alphabet used by the nobility and religious leaders until it was finally replaced with the Latin alphabet which we still use today. Now another name for Oan is the tree alphabet, as each symbol refers to a species of tree. And this is where it gets really interesting, at least for me anyway, as it gives an interesting insight into people's reality back when they lived closer with the forest. And you can understand how relating a symbol with a species of tree would be a tangible way to not only learn the alphabet, but also to convey meaning. The symbol is even red, bottom to top, much like you'd climb a tree. So hopefully that gives you a bit more background, but now let's look at the three staffs in depth and talk about the trees that they're made from, the, the uses of the trees and the beliefs our ancestors attributed to them. Now the first staff we're going to look at is made from hazel, and this is a sort of medium weight staff out of the three. It's about an inch and a quarter thick and it's very, very smooth. It's got a slight curve in it and it has this beautiful rich brown colour that turns to a lighter white near the tip of it. And it's a good sort of weight balance for practicing the martial arts side of things, but it's also, you know, light enough to be good for a hiking staff. Now, the hazel tree was really important for our early ancestors as their nuts are really rich in protein and fat and they were a stable food source um, for people before the rise of agriculture. Now, the, the hazel tree also grows really straight compared to other trees, so it's really handy for building stuff it's really good for making things like arrows and fences. Now the hazel tree also coppices really well. So this is how it was managed for, for thousands of years to basically provide a, a constant wood source for building and for charcoal making. It's a hardwood, but it's fairly lightweight. So it's been a favorite for, for walking sticks and hiking staffs. And uh, people even grew it in a curved mold to, to make shepherd's crooks. Now the Gaelic name for hazel is call or Colton. So burnt at the top of the staff is the symbol for call in the OM alphabet. And you can also see the artwork on the staff 
represents a fish or the salmon of knowledge, which, um, which represents one of my favorite Celtic myths to do with the hazel tree. Now in Celtic mythology, the hazelnut was believed to contain a sort of concentrated wisdom. And you can see this in the similarity between the Gaelic word for hazelnut and the word for wisdom. Now there's an Irish myth that tells of nine hazel trees that surrounded a enchanted pool. And as the hazelnuts fell from the trees into the pool, a salmon came along and ate them all, thus absorbing this sort of wisdom. Now, this knowledge spread across the land to all the people, and it was believed that if you could catch this salmon and eat it, then you could absorb all this wisdom. Now, there was a druid master who heard about this, and he made it his mission to catch and eat this salmon so he could have all the wisdom for himself. And he tried for years and years fishing in all the different pools and rivers trying to catch the salmon of knowledge and didn't get any luck. So he got one of his pupils to help him, a young man. And the, the name of this young pupil was Finn McCool. And finally, after many months of this master druid and Finn McCool trying to catch the salmon, they finally catch it. And the, the master druid commands Finn to, uh, to cook it for him. So Finn builds a fire, gets the fish on the fire, starts cooking. But as Finn goes to, to check the, the flesh of the salmon to see if it's ready to eat, he burns his thumb on some of the hot oil and instinctively quenches the burn in his, in his mouth. Um, and just the small taste of the salmon meant that Finn McCool absorbed all this wisdom and the druid master was left with nothing. So this young pupil then grows on to be this mythical Celtic superhero and uh, there's hundreds of myths about Finn McCool after him gaining this, this wisdom. Um, and I've got a past video talking about another one of my favorite Finn McCool myths. So Kiva created her own representation of the salmon of knowledge and put it at the top of this beautiful hazel staff. Now the second staff we'll look at is made from ash and this is the heaviest of the three. This is a real brute of a stick. Uh, now I harvested this ash tree over 10 years ago for one of my first woodwork projects. I split the trunk into quarters and spent a lot of time shaping it into a big chunky stave, kind of resemblant to a, a European quarter staff. That's a great staff for sort of practicing your quarter staff drills and strength conditioning. Um, and it's still good for, for a hiking staff, but I'd probably recommend it for someone who's a bit bigger and stronger, otherwise you might get a bit tired carrying this around all the time. Now ash wood is very hard and dense, but still has some flexibility. So it was a favorite for making things like the axles for carts, uh, wheel spokes, oars for boats, um, and also weapons uh, from, you know, quarter staffs to the staves of spears and other pole arms. Um, and it's also quite good for making bows if um, something like you isn't available to you. It's really high density, also makes it a great fuel. Um, so this is why the Yule log burnt at the celebration of Yule was often made from ash. Now the Gallic name for the ash tree is Ushin and is represented by this symbol in the Oum alphabet. Now the artwork in the staff is Kiva's very own representation of the tree of life symbol, which is a, a common theme that you see in, in cultures all around the world from Northern Europe all the way to the Amazon basin. But the ash tree specifically in Celtic mythology was attributed to this sort of tree of life. And there's a observable explanation for it as the ash tree is one of the last trees in the forest to get its leaves in springtime, which allows more light to get to the forest floor, allowing a greater diversity of plants to grow under it uh, compared to other trees that get their leaves sooner and thus shade everything out. So you can actually sometimes see that an ash woodland has just got a, a bigger diversity of life in it. Thus, it is the tree of life. And in Norse mythology, the ash tree was a very representation of their mythological reality. And this ash tree was known as Idrisil. And the Norse believed it was this all encompassing massive ash tree that uh, grew on an island on an ocean and in the depths uh, lived a serpent. And up in the canopy lived this eagle. Um, and all the boughs of the tree reached out to all the countries in the world. And a squirrel ran up and down the trunk carrying messages. In the mythology, there was a deer that fed on the, the leaves of the ash tree and from its antlers flowed all the rivers of the earth. There was also a goat, a mythological goat that fed on the tree 
And instead of producing milk, it produced mead to feed the warriors in Odin's hall. The god Thor also had a magical spear made from an ash tree. And, you know, Vikings really loved ash. In fact, they loved it so much that one of the names referring to the, to the Norsemen was Aisling, which means men of ash. Now, the ash tree was also part of the mythology in other parts of Britain and was often planted next to wells in Ireland and the Isle of Man in order to sort of protect them. Unfortunately, nowadays, the ash tree in the UK is under attack from an invasive fungal disease known as ash dieback. Um, so we don't really know what the future holds for the ash tree in the UK. Um, as I said, I harvested this over 10 years ago um, before the, the disease hit Britain. So who knows, maybe this is the last staff I'll be able to make from an ash tree. Now the third and lightest of the staffs is made from birch. Now this is a really beautiful, lightweight, nimble staff. Um, it's got some interesting curves in it, but it's still really, really sturdy. Um, so it's a great lightweight hiking staff. Now the birch is one of my all time favorite trees because it's just so useful, which is lucky because it's also the most common tree in Scotland. Birch is another hardwood, yet it's on the sort of softer end of the, of the spectrum. So it's a favorite for carving, carving things like cups and bowls and cookses. It's also a great fuel, a great firewood, and was a favorite for smoking meat and fish. The birch tree also just has endless survival uses. Its sap can be tapped and drank in early spring as a source of sugar and minerals. Its bark can be used for fire lighting and making containers. Its young leaves can be used to make soap. Uh, tar can be extracted from the bark to use as glue and for waterproofing things. And it has tons of species of useful fungi that grow with or on the birch including the horse hoof fungus, which is used for creating fire, medicinal fungi such as chaga and birch polypore, as well as lots of edible fungi like the birch bolete and chanterelle mushrooms. And they're very tasty, so I'm gonna collect them. Now the birch tree is often referred to as a pioneer species, as it's one of the first species of tree to seed in a new area and its deep roots allows nutrients to be brought up to the surface for other plants to utilize. And this sort of pioneering characteristic is reflected in its mythology, as the birch tree was seen in Celtic mythology as a symbol of renewal and purification. Now, as the birch tree is one of the first trees to get its leaves in spring, it was yeah, used to symbolize spring and renewal and was associated with fertility goddesses, not just in, in Britain, but also other places in Northern Europe, as well as Anglo-Saxon culture. So since it's associated with spring and renewal, it was used in the celebration of Beltane, but it was also used in the celebration of Samhain, uh, which is now what we would refer to as Halloween. And people would make brooms from, from birch twigs and sweep their houses with it as an idea to sort of sweep out bad spirits. And in Highland folklore, people believe that if you rounded up your cattle with a staff made from birch, then your cows were more likely going to get pregnant and have healthy calves. Now the Gaelic name for the birch tree is Bay or Beha, and it's the very first symbol in the Oum alphabet shown there. Now when it came to come up with an art piece for the staff, it was a bit sort of harder to, to think of what to do, but Kiva eventually settled on a wolf. And the reason why she came up with a wolf is that if the birch could be seen as the pioneer of the forest ecosystem, then the wolf is the apex of it and the maintainer of the whole forest. Now the last wolf was shot in Scotland in 1680 by a guy called Sir Ewan Cameron in Killycrankey. And he was considered a bit of a hero doing so. Certainly the farmers were happy that their livestock would be a bit safer. But nowadays we know that large predators like the wolf are actually really important for the health of the forest as they keep the population of herbivores down and they keep the deer always moving, always on their toes so that they're not overgrazing any particular area of forest and killing all the young trees. And there's some really interesting studies from Yellowstone National Park showing the importance for wolves for the health of the forest, which I recommend looking into. And because of this, the wolf has come to symbolize the rewilding movement and there's even proposals to reintroduce the wolf back into Scotland, which is a bit of a controversial subject, something I recommend you read into and come up with your, with your own thoughts on that.
But in any case, that is why Kiva has come up with her own Celtic design of a wolf. The birch is what starts the forest ecosystem and the wolf is what completes it. Now, if you want to learn about the 13 other species of native tree in Scotland, then I recommend checking out the Trees for Life website. They've got some really good information there. But now, how can you win one of these stats for yourself? Well, I'm going to be running a fundraising prize draw the same way I did my knives last year. Basically, go to my website, tomlanghorn.com forward slash shop, and there you can buy one or as many tickets as you like for one or all three of the staffs. I'll be running the fundraising campaign till this closing date. I'll then put all the order numbers into a random number generator to pick the winners. I'll then announce the winners on my YouTube community and my Facebook and Instagram. I'll let the winner know that they won and I'll post it to them free of charge. You can find all the detailed ticket information on my website, so please read that carefully before you buy a ticket. And all the money raised will go into managing, planting and caring for this woodland. It will go into things like tool sheds, tree seedlings, deer fences, tree protectors, all stuff like that. Now this will not only be the new base for the channel, but I also want it to be a space to explore how to live sustainably with the forest inspired from the past and bring it to the present day. Now obviously, in order to live here, some of the trees will be harvested for building material and firewood, but I want to do everything strategically so that I am planting twice as much as I take and some areas of the woodland will just be left completely alone for native forest to flourish. So I'm just so excited to get started here and, and share everything I get up to with you guys. So don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell if you haven't already. Also consider becoming a Patreon if you want extra monthly behind the scenes content. Huge thanks to Kiva for doing such an amazing job on this artwork, on the staves. Good luck everyone on the fundraising prize draw. I hope that you guys can win one of these staves and have it as a faithful hiking companion for many years to come. Thanks for watching folks, and I'll be back with another video as soon as I can. Cheers.